hello everybody and um, very happy to have been invited to give you this uh, webinar and today we're going to talk about CAR T cell therapy for adult ALL. Thank you all for tuning in and I hope you guys are okay and safe and I hope your your family and your patients as well are not struggling too much with uh, these crazy times and what we're going through right now with the, the COVID-19. So I'm not going to talk about the COVID-19 today. Uh, I'm going to talk about adult ALL and using CAR T cells for these patients and particularly for patients with, with relapse and refractory disease. So first I'd like to start with some disclosure. And the first thing is that I'm going to talk about pretty extensively about a, a clinical trial that was carried out at the Hutch at my institution. And that was, uh, this trial was funded by Gina Therapeutics, which is now a cell gene uh, slash BMS company. Uh, I've not received any funding directly from these companies, but I've been involved in the, uh, the data analysis of this of different clinical trials. And we're going to talk about today about a, a range of different CAR T-cell products. And um, basically, most of them are off-label and have not been approved. So that's something very important to consider. And to date, only one uh, product that is approved by the FDA and the EMA, uh, which is Kimria, also called Tisagen Leclusal. And the, uh, the indication is very restrictive, which is uh, for patients up to 25 years of age with BALL in refractory or in second or later relapse. So basically, there, there is no product approved for adult patients with ALL. So that's very, something very important to consider. Uh, Hopefully things may change in the future, and we're going to talk talk about it again um, during this presentation. So uh, some educational goals, and what are we going to review today? I would like to um, pretty emphasize emphasize some of the signs and the risk factors associated with severe cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity. And this is very important, and this has been really a challenge for the field and really a challenge to try to move CAR T cells further and get products approved quicker, and particularly in adult patients. We're going to obviously talk about how does that work in, in ALL and what's the efficacy data uh, of using CD19 CAR T cells. And another important question is that is, uh, are CD19 CAR T cells curative or is this just a fancy bridge towards a consolidate consolidative allergenic transplants after CAR T cells. So all, all these three things we're going to talk about pretty uh, um, extensively and uh, this is really the, the two elephants in the room. First is how do we prevent severe toxicity and how do we improve response durability and the field is uh, tackling and um, challenging and being very challenged by these two, uh, these two things. So first very quickly ALL is a disease more common in the pediatric population, you all know that. And it has a sort of a strange uh, distribution with a, a sort of a later peak, so a little bit of a bimodal distribution. And we see also um, quite a, a lot of uh, ALL cases, actually more than 50% of patients are older than uh, 20 years old. And we see a little bit of a peak between uh, 60 and 70 year old. Uh, so this is important to consider. Uh, overall, when we look at what are the outcomes of relapsed ALL? Uh, pretty different when we compare the pediatric to the adult population. And I think that the key finding here is that it's much, a diff much more difficult to salvage these patients uh, in the adult setting. And you could see that we've made tremendous progress over the past uh, two or three decades in improving outcome of relapsed pediatric ALL with long-term uh, overall survival in a 60 to 70% range. But in adult patients, uh, the results are, are clearly a little more, uh, clearly less, um, uh, you know, are clearly worse with uh, overall long-term outcomes in the 20 to 30 percent range in terms of overall survival. And this is regardless of the strategy that is being used, chemotherapy or allergenic transplantation. Okay, so uh, the data I'm going to talk about mainly uh, a lot today about is originates from a phase one two study carried out of our institution and this is using uh, this uh, lentiviral vector here so I will highlight some of the characteristics. This is using a CD19 uh, targeted SCFV, this is a murine SCFV and transgene uh, include a 41BB co-stimulatory domain 
and we're using a, an EGFR truncated uh, protein to be able to track uh, to track the CAR T cells using flow cytometry. Very specific to this platform is the use of a defined composition of CD8 and CD4 T cells that are formulated in a one-to-one -one, uh, fashion, and the CAR T cells are uh, infused after lymphodepletion chemotherapy. So this was a phase one slash two study and three dose levels were uh, evaluated. This is detailing the objectives of the study and the eligibility criteria, which basically uh, included patients with relapsed or refractory uh, B-cell malignancies, including not only uh, BALL, but also NHL and CLL patients. Uh, only adult patients, um, above the age of 18 were excluded and the, the inclusion criteria were a little more a little less stringent compared to other commercial um, studies in particular there was no uh, criteria based on the, the lymphocyte count having circulated tumor um, prior transplant were allowed there was no text, test expansion of the t cells and which is a bit unusual about this trial is that almost 200 patients ended up being treated um, on the phase one, two study, and we've learned tremendously from this data set and published, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, a number of, uh, number of publications here. So first, what are the toxicities of CD19 CAR T cells? I will focus on CD19 dependent toxicities and namely cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity. So the first thing to consider is that there is a a great overlap between the two toxicities. In other words, it's very rare to develop severe neurologic toxicity if you have not developed a previously um, severe, um, severe or significant cytokine release syndrome. So um, in other words, if you haven't developed cytokine release syndrome, it's unlikely uh, that you will develop neurologic toxicity. And when we talk about cytokine release syndrome, it's, this is a syndrome, so a constellation of different symptoms. And the hallmark is obviously fever, there is tachycardia, shaking chills. And as we go uh, deeper in terms of severity, patients may present with hypertension, um, difficulties breathing, hypoxia, capillary syndrome, some coagulopathies. Marrow dysfunction is often seen as well with sometimes profound cytopenia. And in the worst cases, multi organ failure and uh, quite often some HLH-like pictures as well. So we're gonna go a little deeper into what is characteristic of severe CRS in, in a few minutes. Neurologic toxicity also includes a wide range of symptoms, uh, ranging from headaches, uh, mild headaches, tremors. Uh, a very common symptoms is expressive uh, aphasia with some uh, word-finding difficulties, speech disturbances. And again, uh, as we go uh, deeper into the severity of this uh, syndrome, patients may present with delirium, seizures, sometimes focal deficits, and altered consciousness with the most severe, sometimes fatal forms uh, presenting with cerebral uh, edema. And we will go a little, we will, I will show you a little more data about this as well. Uh, so what's uh, a very, a very simple and clinical uh, sign of severe cytokine release syndrome after CAR T cell therapy is what is what is the kinetics and the onset of this of the fever and what we, this is showing you here. So on the x-axis, this is the time uh, going from the pre and depletion time point all the way to day 30. I'm just showing you the temperature curve, and as you can see, just this the kinetics of uh, the the temperature is. Uh, a very good reflection of, of the severity uh, in, in these patients. And as you could see that in the red curve here, a patient with grade four or above cytokine release syndrome, so this is particularly severe CRS, um, virtually all of them had very early onset of fever within 36 hours, and the fever was at very high levels, and uh, in most patients above 39.5 uh, degrees. So this was a little less true when we looked at grade one to three, and, and this is obviously patients which did not present with cytokine release syndrome. So um, particular, uh, this is a very important finding and a very, a very simple clinical uh, sign that patients developing early and high fevers are at risk of developing significant and severe CRS. So what are the other signs of severe CRS? 
um, two important things is the development of a early and uh, profound capillary leak syndrome uh, reflected here, uh, different clinical parameters. You could see a, a very early and abrupt drop in the systolic diastolic pressure, tachycardia, hypopnea, hypoalbuminemia, hypoproteinuria with a significant weight gain as well. So all hallmarks of uh, severe capillary leak syndrome. Consumptive coagulopathy also uh, is very commonly uh, commonly observed um, after severe um, in the context of severe CRS. You can see here some different coagulation studies with prolonged PT, PTT, increased D dimers, and uh, a drop in the fibrinogen as well. So all these things you, you will find and see in patients with severe CRS. Now switching to neurologic toxicity, this is an example of a patient who uh, passed away from fatal cerebral edema in the context of uh, neurologic toxicity. And uh, this is what you don't want to see in your patient, which is, um, this is significant damage to these deep uh, structures of the brain with this here bilateral uh, thalamic edema, something also some edema in the brainstem in the pons. And here, the significant diffuse cerebral edema with a thinning of the lateral ventricles and this blurring of the gray white uh, matter junction here. So, how often do we see this happen um, in ALL patients treated with CD19 CAR T cells? Well, it's actually uh, very frequently observed, unfortunately, and it's been uh, really a challenge for the field. And you can see across a range of different studies with a caveat that. Um, the, these different institutions and studies use different grading systems to make the life a little more difficult. And you could see that the range of the incidence of CR, severe CRS was from 13 uh, to almost 50 percent here in the in the Juliet in sorry in the Iliana trial. So pretty significant and um, really really an issue in this in this context. Again, as well as we mentioned earlier, there's an overlap between CRS and neurologic toxicity, so we're not too surprised to see that uh, a, a quite a similar trend with high incidence of uh, severe neurologic toxicity, with uh, numbers ranging from 10 to almost 56 percent. And that was in the, in the rocket uh, study, and these very high rates of neurologic toxicity led to the uh, premature uh, termination of that study. Um, so one little signal that we may see from this, you know, looking across different clinical trials, and it's obviously a bit difficult because the studies were using different CAR constructs, had enrolled different patients, and here I'm including some uh, pediatric study as well, is that the, this neurologic toxicity seems uh, a little less severe in the, in the pediatric setting. For example, if we look at the Eliana trial with only 13% of patients uh, presenting with severe neurologic toxicity. So uh, overall, uh, high incidence of these toxicities, but uh, luckily very few deaths. And if we look again, uh, we do a panoramically across these different trials, all, only a handful of deaths attributed to CAR T cell therapy. Uh, besides, obviously, again, the, this, the Juno rocket trial uh, that was terminated with five patients who uh, passed away from uh, uh, fatal neurologic toxicity. So uh, in, in perspective, we are used to very high non-relapse mortality, for example, with allogenic transplantation. And this is obviously not the case with uh, CD19 CAR T cells. But still, um, this is uh, something that has been limiting to develop these new therapies. So next, how can we predict what's going to happen when we treat patients with CAR T cells in ALL? And have we identified some predictive factors? And this is a work we've uh, published a couple of years ago now in blood, and we did some multivariable analysis looking at the severity of cytokine release syndrome using an ordinal regression uh, model. And what we were, and as expected, basically the, the, the amount of CD19 positive burden, and we, we could look at the bone marrow uh, by flow cytometry, and there's different ways of looking at it, but overall, uh, this was strongly associated with the severity of the cytokine release syndrome. Uh, again, um, in addition to this, the type of lymphodepletion and cytobase lymphodepletion 
was also associated with more severe CRS and higher dose of CAR T cells uh, as well. So we've shown previously that cyclobased lymphoid depletion was associated with uh, more robust in vivo expansion of CAR T cells and also a better uh, response as well. Now, if we switch to neurologic toxicity, uh, very similar findings. Again, the amount of CD19 burden in the marrow uh, was uh, strongly associated with uh, severe CRS, the type of lymphoid depletion and cyclone lymphoid depletion and the dose of CAR T cells as well. Uh, it was a little less clear but, uh, for pre-existing neurologic comorbidities, but it seemed that there was also an, associate, an association in multivariable analysis here with the uh, severity of neurologic toxicity. And so here we are facing uh, um, something that we, we used to be a little used to with a GVH versus um, GVL effect. And what we see here is that um, the, the kinetics of CAR T cells or the inspect, expansion of CAR T cells in vivo uh, influence not only the toxicity but also the efficacy of CAR T cell, uh, also the efficacy of CAR T cell therapy. In other words, that the higher the expansion of the CAR T cells in vivo, uh, the higher the probability of severe toxicity, but also uh, the higher the probability of efficacy. So we, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword, and we, we see that we have a very narrow trade-off. If we were to try to reduce in vivo expansion, this would come at the price of uh, also a decrease in the anti-tumor effects of CAR T cells. Okay, so practically, how do we prevent these toxicities? And we talked about heuristic prediction and the models. This is still, uh, in my view, uh, quite preliminary, and we need some better uh, predictive models. We need bigger numbers, and we need good validation uh, of these models to try to identify more robustly who is at very high risk of cytokine release syndrome and bad neurologic toxicity. So some pragmatic ways of, of doing this is right now is to identify patients with very high marrow burden and some, some uh, people have been using different thresholds, 5 or 10 percent, and it's a little bit unclear at this stage what the exact relationship, and there's obviously no magic threshold, but uh, overall um, you could tell that is as, as the higher the, the marrow burden, the, the more at risk of patient is uh, to develop severe toxicities. We can debulk patients prior to CAR T cell therapy, and I think that that's a practice that's being shared by a lot of different institutions. And um, and this means not to try not to give CAR T cells when the disease is completely out of control with very high marrow burden of circulating tumor and very high LDH, for example. Um, other efforts have included to adjust the dose of CAR T cells, and there are different approaches, for example, um, those adjust or reduce according to the percentage of myroblasts, uh, according to a, an arbitrary threshold, and we've been using this approach, as a, this approach quite successfully at our institutions. Another method is to uh, split the dose of CAR T cells into, for example, a 10, 30, and 60 percent uh, split over three days, and obviously you do not give the subsequent doses in case of um, if the, your patient is presenting with toxicity. Other approaches uh, include re-engineering re the CAR itself and, and tweak the affinity of the CAR T cells. A paper, an interesting paper published last year, Nature Medicine, uh, sh showed that it was possible to use a lower affinity uh, CD19 targeted CAR T cells without um, losing the efficacy but, by, uh, but reducing the toxicity. Other approaches I anticipate to be um, an area of intense focus will be the use of targeted agents and pathway inhibitors. And uh, we've reported, uh, not in ALL, but in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the use of ibrutinib, which might be beneficial to um, reduce the risk of severe toxicities. And there is in vitro data showing encouraging uh, uh, results using an ITK, a therazine kinase inhibitor, desatinib. So these are still um, being evaluated in some clinical trials. A lot of remaining questions regarding toxicity. What's the best timing of intervention and overall uh, the field, I think, has been intervening uh, earlier, which means we would not wait until the patient is in the ICU on multiple presses or mechanical ventilation. We would uh, not wait until this, but as soon as um, the patient, for example, is 
um, uh, is reaching a grade two using the ASTCT uh, classification. And when we see the patient is progressing to uh, more and more severe uh, toxicity, we would uh, intervene at that stage using dexamethasone and uh, Is there room for the prophylactic use of the cytokine directed therapies? And what's the differential impact of these new uh, of these therapies on CRS compared to neurologic toxicity? We know that, uh, for example, tocilizumab has no CNS penetration, and uh, its role to prevent or treat neurologic toxicity is probably uh, limited. And uh, an important question as well is, what is the impact of um, steroids and tocilizumab or other cytokine directed therapies on the expansion and the persistence of CAR T cells. Some groups have suggested there is that there is no uh, impact, but I think we have to be um, extremely careful, and we need more data and bigger numbers to to really uh, assess the impact of these uh, therapies. Okay, now we've talked a lot about toxicity, and uh, I'm going to switch gear, and we're going to talk about um, the efficacy and not only the rates of response, but the durability of responses. And we're going to try to talk about allogenic transplant as a consolidation and uh, CD19 and negative relapses as well. So again, looking at here, four uh, major trials in uh, adult ALL, we could see that the rates of MRD negative uh, complete remission by flow, multi-parameter flow cytometry are very high in the 60 to 80% range. Uh, contrasting with a uh, relatively short duration of response across these different studies from 8 to 18 months. And this is obviously confounded by um, a varying percentage of patients that were consolidated with an allo transplant, as you can see, uh, 40 to up to 75% of patients in the, in the NIH study. Also, uh, different range of medium follow-up that can confound uh, these observations. So uh, high response rates, but duration of response remains uh, limited. And how can we improve this? And there's uh, obviously cancer therapy is a multi-step, quite complex um, modality, and a lot of things can be considered. So at first, um, the way we, we, we approach this was to say, okay, what are the factors that impact duration of response in ALL, uh, patients achieving CR? And we use multivariable modeling to look at that and I'm gonna show you this in the next couple of slides. And can we just, and the second thing that we did was that, can we just look at it um, very descriptively, descriptively and look at patterns of relapse uh, in these patients? So first thing is that the long-term outcomes of the gene and DIN-CAR T cells are still modest. Uh, and this is data from our group that we published last year. And we had a fairly long a medium follow-up, 31 months. And you could see that two year, even free survival, was 34% uh, with median of 7.6 months, and the overall survival at two years was 48%. And I'm telling you this in a group of patients who achieved an, an MRD negative complete remission. And uh, again, we were interested in looking at what's the depth of the response, and it was actually, we were happy to see that 71% of patients with a trackable clone that went into uh, MRD neg response by by this um, by next generation sequencing. So we, we can obtain very deep responses, but even in this group, we could see that the, the median was 8.4, the median EFS was 8.4 months, and the, the long term overall survival was 55%. So encouraging results, but still quite uh, perfectible results uh, as well. So, in terms of what are the risk factors, what factors can predict? Uh, this the, the duration of response in patients who respond to RT cells. And uh, we identified three different factors uh, using multivariable Cox regression: the LDH serum concentration prior to lymphodepletion, the platelet counts prior to lymphodepletion. Having a higher platelet count was beneficial. In other words, thrombocytopenia was a uh, detrimental factor for duration of response and. The um, site flu lymphodepletion, cyclophosphamide, the darabin based uh, lymphodepletion, was very strongly associated with uh, duration of response as well. And uh, again, this is confounded by the um, 
something that happens in the future after CAR T cell therapy, which is that for, in, in, in this data set, 40% uh, of patients um, were actually bridged uh, to another transplant in CR. So this makes our modeling a little bit more complicated. And what we did is to uh, incorporate our transplant as a, a time dependent variable and uh, and the bottom line here is that we don't really know what, what the impact is. And uh, it may suggest uh, looking at the point estimate, the beneficial effect and halving your, um, your, your risk of, of progression. But uh, we're looking at the confidence interval, which is spanning pretty, pretty wide and the p-value of 0.13, um, which is basically telling you that um, we, we don't know at this stage. And, ALO can be associated with either a protective or a, a detrimental effect on out outcomes here. So more data is needed and uh, hopefully we will get this data in the future to sort of clarify the, the role of this um, of allergenic transplant after CAR T cells. Um, having said that, when we looked specifically at these 18 patients successfully bridged to an ALO transplant, and this is obviously a hyper ultra selective population uh, outcomes were pretty good and um, after allo the two years efs was 61 percent and actually the first cause of mortality post allo was non relapse mortality and only uh, 17 percent of patients uh, relapsed uh, at two years so um, basically we, we conclude that this is a feasible bridge uh, at a transplant was feasible bridge and outcomes were um, quite promising um, in this setting. We're look, looking at other data, not from our centers, but from other groups. Um, it's uh, a little difficult to tease out, and I really like to emphasize that at this stage, its role of other transplant consolidation is undetermined and should sort of remain standard of care, um, from what we know from, from uh, historical data. And NIH showed uh, in this analysis uh, that other transplants had a better, better um, long-term outcomes um, in, in the MSK series published in New England two years ago. Outcomes were exactly uh, sim similar. Obviously, this is unadjusted, um, descriptive, sort of crude estimates. Um, again, this is, if you remember your biostatistics class, uh, you shouldn't do this uh, Kaplan-Meier analysis stratifying on an event that's occurring in the future. So, um, as much as we, we truly want to know what out of transplant is doing, we, we should probably not graph this uh, Kaplan-Meier curves. And another way of looking at it is simply, are we obtaining a plateau in survival after CAR T cells in absence of uh, an allo transplant? And if we turn to the pediatric uh, literature, there's data from Seattle Children's, Plat02, and the Eliana data, uh, we could see that even though in the Seattle data about a third of patients uh, were bridged to a transplant, we, we could see uh, a plateau after one year here. And I think even more importantly, I think this is really critical data, again, in the pediatric population, but we see again a plateau after one year uh, in the Eliana trial in CR patients without, in, with the, an overwhelming majority of these patients were not transplanted, only 9% of these patients uh, received another transplant after CAR T cells. So it, it, to me, it clearly indicates that CAR T cells, CD19 CAR T cells, are, might be curative uh, in your pediatric, pediatric setting, but I think we're seeing a very different picture uh, in the adult population. And this is again during the stratification ADO versus no, not ADO, and this is listing all the problems in doing this type of analysis. And another way of doing that is to do informative censoring and to sense of patients that get another transplant after CAR T cells, but then you, you're also meeting some other caveats and uh, some issues in, in making reliable estimates. Um, so in, in conclusion, I think what we can really tell to date with, with published data is that there is a, a different picture that is seen in the pediatric versus the adult population. And in the pediatric, uh, my feeling is that CAR T cells may be curative, we still need more follow-up, but the survival curve seems to plateau in the absence of adult transplant, and this is based on the Eliana data. In the adult setting, uh, we see a much more humbling uh, picture with 
median duration of response that is short in most studies and ranging from 8 to 18 months, despite having a lot of these patients getting a consolidated other transplant. So role is very unclear. Uh, we need much bigger data sets and we need a better modeling to sort of clarify this role. And uh, there may be some subgroups of patients that may not benefit from transplant, but I think at this stage we do recommend uh, consolidation without a transplant if feasible uh, in patients that get in, in a good response after CAR T-cell therapy in ALR patients, obviously. Um, I was talking about earlier what can be the patterns of relapses. We say, I mentioned many times now that duration of response is an issue. And uh, we do see some different patterns and uh, despite having some limited numbers, but almost universally CD19 positive relapses occur in the setting of loss of CAR T cell persistence by uh, QPCR. And this is showing you um, a swim of plots of patients, one line, one row is one patient. And you could see color coded the amount of detectable transgene copies and grays having lost uh, CAR T cell persistence. Relapse is a little cross, and usually these cross are in the gray areas, which means that patients lost persistence prior to relapse, prior to CD19 positive relapse. Uh, in contrast, relapsing with a CD19 negative clone was usually seen pretty early on after CAR T cell treatment, usually within six months. And um, in most patients, CAR T cells were still detectable uh, using uh, quantitative PCR. So the CD19 negative relapses are, are really an issue as well, and uh, a challenge of targeting only one antigen. And across big variations across studies, seven up to 20% of patients uh, relapse with these CD19 negative clones. And a range of different mechanisms have been described with some sort of debate or controversies as to what's the exact uh, biological um, mechanism underlying this loss of target epitope or loss of CD19 expression. So uh, different things have been described, some mutation within the CD19 gene leading to truncation of the protein, some splicing variants also have been described. Uh, we and others have reported some a complete lineage uh, switch to uh, myeloleukemia, and this was more frequently observed in patients with um, MLL rearrangements. Last, this is one anecdotal uh, case report of um, a CAR T cell, uh, sorry, an ALL blast that was transduced with the CAR, and this led to the intracellular binding of the CAR to CD19. and uh, in turn leading to loss of CD19 expression and relapse with the CD19 uh, negative clone. So the bottom line is that uh, there is still a lot that we don't understand about what happens uh, when uh, patients relapse with CD19 negative clone, but we need to uh, try and prevent these uh, CD19 negative relapses. So what can we do for that? The obvious thing is to go beyond the CD19 ant antigen and um, numerous efforts have been carried out to target other antigens such as CD22 and other approach um, have uh, included by antigen targeting or now uh, tri antigen targeting and this is a paper that just came out in leukemia targeting CD19, CD20 and CD22 and this is really going to be the next step for uh, CAR T cell therapy for ALL and uh, there's a lot of data pending and uh, we should keep our eyes peeled to see if we can truly improve duration of responses, uh, particularly in adult patients. Other thing is we need to prevent just the loss of CAR T cell persistence, and there are different ways we can uh, go about it. Um, currently under investigation is the use of a fully human or humanized single chain variable fragment to reduce the risk of immune rejection. Uh, we have an ongoing trial uh, that is still enrolling uh, at our institution. We've reported some preliminary data uh, as two years ago. Another option is to use something that we've been now using in other types of uh, hematology, could solid tumors, uh, solid, malign solid tumor malignancies, is the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there's a, a number of studies that 
ongoing that have been reported in abstract form using, for example, uh, our uh, GK14 for maybe RT cell with the value map, uh, a monoclonal antibody against pd one but other groups have reported as well, combining, for example, axi cell with atezolizumab or chisogen cell with pembrolizumab uh, or pembrolizumab and, or nivolumab as well in ALL. So very preliminary data. It's uh, unclear at this stage whether this will be uh, uh, efficient uh, at improving CAR T cell persistence, but these trials are on the way. And I think this is my last slide, and this is really the a, a key takeaway from that as well, is that we, we truly need an approved CAR T product for adult ALL, and this is lacking to date. I mentioned a couple of times earlier the ROCKET trial that suffered from five uh, deaths from neurologic toxicity and this really led the industry and the field to shy away from testing uh, CAR T cells in adult ALL because of that risk, the potential risk of toxicity. And I sort of applaud uh, Kite Pharma to, to still uh, power through and, and conduct that tumor 3 trial. And um, this trial hasn't been updated in a while, and this is from last year at ASCO. Uh, they reported the, the end result of this phase one study, um, of the phase one part of the study using a modified version of Giscada with a modified, modified manufacturing and the products called KTE X19. And this was uh, evaluated in adult patients with ALL and one of the inclusion criteria was having more than 5% blast. So these patients have a really high risk of toxicity. And the, the good news is that they've seen some, again, some really good efficacy with and I'm only showing you the data from the, the 1 million CAR T cells per kilo cohort. Only 23 patients, that's the dose that will be evaluated in the phase two part of the study. 84% of MRD negative CR and high rates of toxicity uh, as expected. All patients develop cytokine release syndrome. About a quarter developed for three or above cytokine release syndrome. Uh, in terms of neurologic toxicity, 87% any grade neurotox and 43% uh, of uh, grade three above neurologic toxicity. So um, importantly, they report that they, they modified the protocol and they, and they used um, a different approach to try to reduce this amount of severe neurologic toxicity. And, and both the severity and the duration of, neuro, of neurotox was um, uh, improved using an, a strategy with earlier intervention with steroids. And they also stopped using tocilizumab uh, for new for new neurotox in the absence of CRS, so I think these are very encouraging results, and uh, we I anticipate this product to to be brought to the FDA at some point, and this is likely to be the the first uh, CAR T product approved for adult uh, ALL. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this uh, clinical trial. And this is it. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, involved at the Hutch in uh, CAR T cell trials and. Uh, I would like to thank my mentor, Cameron Turtle and Dave Maloney for all the support and uh, helping me uh, initially come to the Hutch and stay at the Hutch now as a faculty. And uh, also thanks to the clinical people at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance involved in these clinical trials. And thanks to Juno for funding uh, these trials as well. And that's the end of my, of my talk. And uh, I'm not sure how it works for questions, but I'm happy to uh, connect through Twitter or shoot me an email if you have any questions. Thank you and enjoy the rest of this seminar. Bye-bye.